I want to talk to you about falling in love with nature. Human beings are incredibly good or efficient observers. Um, essentially, our, our, our little primate self is out there in the forest, and it's looking around, and it sees something new and novel, and it goes, can it eat me? And it goes, can I eat it? And once you've got these basic things figured out, your very efficient self goes on to the next thing. And so there is, there's a place where we're just sort of conditioned to stop paying attention to the world. And this allows us to very efficiently move through the world. There's more data coming in through our senses than our brain can possibly manage. But so much of the beauty and the elegance and the delight of life ends up on the cutting room floor those sorts of things that your brain hasn't allowed to come to its attention. So I want to share with you an approach that I have found has revolutionized the way I stand and play and exist in nature. And for you perhaps as, as a scientist yourself to try this on and see if these approaches, if these techniques can move back that veil and let you step through to the other side, to a land of infinite wonder, beauty, and curiosity. It all starts with somehow learning how to pay greater attention. I think that the, the instructions to, to look carefully at this are utterly useless. What does it, what does it really mean? to look carefully at something. Are you supposed to... I mean, look, no, look really hard. You know, you're thinking like, am I, what, am, I, am I seeing it right? You know? And part of what happens when you're looking hard at something, you can be staring, but the, the, the thing is that, that, that observation, it doesn't happen with your eyes. Observation isn't happening in your eyes. Observation is happening in your brain. So what we want to do is, if I can find a way that's going to more deeply engage my brain, I can be pre present with whatever it is that I'm encountering in a much more nuanced, joyful, and amazing way that will open up the doors of connection to nature for you, will utterly rock your world. The, the general approach that I have, I think of a sort of a three-part exercise that I do, and it starts with somehow getting myself to focus and to notice details with greater clarity and sophistication. So again, if I just stare at something, it's not going to end up well for you, all right? But, but what works, um, you know, when, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm looking at this thing, what's happening is there's data coming in off of this, more than my brain can manage. Most of it is just blasting out the back of my head. And my brain is going to go like, is there anything that's really essential for my survival here? If so, I'm going to take note of that. But if not, <laughs> right? But things don't have to be important for your survival to be significant. And so what works is, is a little strategy called the production effect. And that is, if I say out loud whatever it is that I'm noticing and observing, each one of those discrete little observations, instead of blasting out the top of my head, they will stick in my brain. And so if I just start out loud narrating each observation, each observation, each observation, that grows and grows and grows and grows. You've probably seen this, this uh, kind of a, a version of this production effect happen to you. Anybody been to a party and you walk up to somebody and you say, you know, how, how, do you, how do you do? <clears throat> my name's Jack, and they introduce themselves. Hello, my name's Kristen. It's really nice to meet you. And then you're thinking, what was her name? <laughs> all right. It's all, I mean, she just said it, and it's gone. All right. So if instead, what you do is you, you say, um, hi, my name's Jack. Hi, Jack. I'm Kristen. Hey, Kristen. It's nice to meet you. It's 40% more likely that I'm going to remember that. Just by saying Kristen, right? And, and, and so 
what you want to do is apply that to observing in nature. And we have this idea that you, 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 you look with your eyes, not with your mouth. But actually, to get from your eyes to your mouth, you have to go through your brain. And that's why it works. And so, what you, so this idea of you don't just observe, but you're going to say what you see, say what you see, say what you see. It feels awkward at first, but you're going to get over it. And then this will just be your kind of go-to mode. So then what happens is these observations are coming through. The next step is to go to, let those observations stimulate a question in your head. From what you're looking at, what, what do I wonder about that? Right? Can, there is things that I'm curious about. My memory of those is better. Things that I'm intentional, that I'm actually curious about, my learning is enhanced about those things. And also, curiosity makes whatever you do fun. You actually get a squirt of dopamine from curiosity. But you don't have to just walk around and, and find something that you're curious about. You can actually push your own curiosity. You're not stuck with the curiosity you've got. Curiosity is a skill that you can develop so what I will often do is I'll, I'll look at something and there, there, I know there are questions in here and I have to let those come out because we're in a culture that's allergic to questions. We like people who have all the answers and so sometimes we look at people who don't know stuff, ooh, that's a vulnerability, that's a weakness. No, it's actually honesty. Right? And what you want to do is when you, you want to, to can, can you instead of just confirming all the things that you know about what I should be here, how quickly can I run up to the edge of the unknown and dive off? Right. Um, I recently was visiting an international school, and I saw on the wall of every little classroom a list of questioning prompts. And after looking at these in, in a few classes, I realized that this was an utterly brilliant list of prompts to take my questioning strategies to the next level. So I wrote it down in the back of my, my journal, and here is the list. All right, I actually have, have added to it and modified it a, a little bit. But the, the way you use this is that each one of these prompts will get your brain to think a little bit differently about whatever it is that you're looking at. So if I'm looking at this from a point of, of, of function, how does this work? The questions that I'm going to be asking are going to be really different than, like, how is this connected to other things in the forest? Right. So just take a look at this list, and what I'd like you to do is to, for yourself, choose which one for you you think would be kind of the most interesting kind of game changer to add to your personal kind of uh, exploration process. Decide which one. We're going to take 30 seconds right now. You're going to turn to a stranger sitting next to you and tell them why. Go. Go. <laughs> so the next step, the third piece in this puzzle, I have I notice, I have I wonder, Right? is to intentionally draw connections between what I'm looking at and other things that I've observed or learned before. How is this related to other things that I've seen, other things that I have learned? You've got a huge data bank of experience in your head, and you want to go into that. Sometimes these, these, these recollections will automatically pop out their own. This is kind of like when, but if those don't come on their own, you can help it along. You can say, you know, this reminds me of, and just kind of wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, and really look for it. What, what fills in is going to enrich your experience and help you kind of create personal meaning with whatever it is, and often takes your whole questioning process and observation process and brings it up to the next level. Because, um, you know, sometimes if this, reminds, if this reminds me of that, well, there might be some sort of similarity behind these that's kind of driving that. So these three factors play together and interact with each other. It usually starts with I notice, and I just start a cascade of my observations. And then a question comes up. That question makes me then make other observations to try to answer it. That reminds me of something else, and then, oh, that brings up another question. And then this, this whole play begins to happen. But it's critical that you're not trying to do this inside your head. When we try to think inside our head, we, we just sort of stew on the same idea. But you, get, you externalize your thinking and it really starts to open up. Now, if you want to take this process to 11, 
rather than just being there in a conversation with what you're thinking about, what would happen if you train this to your friends, your naturalist buddies, your hiking friends, your children, your classmates? When you start doing this, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, in a little group of people, you get the full advantage of the sorts of questions that somebody else would ask, but it never occurred to you. Their observations are going to be different than yours. And certainly the it reminds me of that they bring to table are going to open up a whole new world for you as well. So one level is just doing it when I'm out there by myself in the middle of the forest, nobody else watching me. I'm out there, I'm actually talking to the trees. Right? <laughs> this has advantage of expanding my ability to think and to wonder. And also, if somebody else does come along, everybody leaves you alone. <laughs> right? But if you get to do this with some buddies, it's so much more fun. So this is something that we can actually teach to other people. And then there is one last tool in our toolkit. And this, for me, has been an utter game changer in how to explore the world. And what it is, is keeping a journal. And in this journal, you'll notice what, what this is, is I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, just put down on paper. So there's all my observations up there. Over in the corner there, you can see, it reminds me of, I was out in the middle of Sierra Valley in a with a nearby thunderstorm. Wind was howling around, and I was stopping, I was watching the lightning and thunder. And then I turned the other direction, and out my car window on the other side, there was a kestrel, an American kestrel, boop, right there. It hadn't flown away. And, and whenever the wind would blow, it would, it would lean down into the wind. And then the wind would abate a little and it would pop up. And it was doing this sort of sort of thing. And so I'm, I'm writing down my, my observations about it. I'm also writing down my questions. My It reminds me of it. It reminded me of like a kid playing in the surf. It reminded me of those little Krumholtz high elevation trees. I want to sort of see what else co sort of comes to me. But there's also a very powerful thing that happens when you get these ideas down on paper like this. Then what happens is those concrete observations, they stand out to you a little bit more. And what this actually allows me to do is to disagree with myself. So I'm sitting here, I'm looking at this thing, how it rips this thing apart, and notice it says lifts head and straightens back and legs. And I take a closer look at it, and no, it actually isn't lifting its head. What was the last time you actually disagreed with yourself and knew it? All right? So this allows me, by getting it on the paper, to move my learning forward. Similarly with my questions, all right, I was wondering, why didn't this bird fly off? If I put my guesses down, my hypotheses about what could be going on, onto that piece of paper, whew, right, I'm able to sort of see my thinking process. This is my brain on paper. <laughs> right? There's my thinking process staring back to me. So I was wondering, did it not fly away? Well, let's see. Well, because it was just sensory overload from the wind, or it's too hard to fly in this kind of wind, or they don't like to fly when they've got a little mouse in their talons. And then, while I'm watching this, the bird opens its wings, lifts into the air, and flies off effortlessly in this pounding wind. And so I realized, well, I can actually probably take one of those guesses off the table. So this allows me to be much more articulate with my thinking process. The whole process, then, is a ton of fun. And so when you get it out of your head and into conversation or there in discussion with other people um, or, um, or onto a piece of paper, that's where the real magic happens. So this then is my process. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. And then finding a way to externalize those ideas, to get those ideas down onto paper. These cues have forced me to pay attention much more deeply to the world around me. And attention is the, what the fabric of love is made from. Love, the most useful kind of working definition I found for it, is sustained compassionate attention. Think about that in terms of yourself and your child. Sustained compassionate attention. We're able to put this down and really be there. It changes you 
it changes them. The same is true with nature. When we can get ourselves to give that sustained, compassionate attention to the natural world around us, nature opens up to us, and our world is never the same. And that is what gives us the motivation then to serve as a steward of nature. Thank you very much, and go out and play.